Hi, I'm Paul Frields, and I'm going to show you how you can set up your Behringer motor controller with Pro Tools 12. If you're a home studio musician like I am, you're probably looking for a budget controller, something that you can work with but isn't going to totally break the bank. These are actually a good deal for the money, especially if you can find one used. The Behringer keybed is fantastic. I've even had a few keyboard friends come over and try it and say they really preferred it uh, to some of the controllers they have. Um, the motor's also got some great other stuff on it. It's got motorized faders and, you know, it uses banks. So you have the power of up to 32 faders, encoder knobs, and pads. Plus, it's got a full set of transport controls and a motorized always-on master fader. Every single one of those things can be reprogrammed with different MIDI controls, which makes it, in my estimation, a really good deal. Now, if you want to skip ahead to see how to do this, I'm going to leave a note in the uh, description below the video, and it'll give you a link that'll send you directly to the time where I start talking about how to do stuff. But if you're just getting started and you haven't figured this stuff out on your own, um, there's a good chance that you could learn something from the next couple minutes before we get into the programming of the controller. So stick with me. So the main problem with the motor in terms of integrating with Pro Tools is that it doesn't really come set up well for a Pro Tools system. Um, now, if you've been around the internet looking for information on how to make it work, probably like me, you got very frustrated. And if you have your motor controller, you may have felt like, gee, why did I invest money in this thing? Maybe it's not such a good deal. The key here is, is that you have to remember a lot of people on the internet don't know what they're talking about sometimes. You can actually easily teach your motor to speak the extended language that an M-Audio keyboard MIDI controller uses. Really, for the most part, those are a customized set of MIDI controls that you can use. Now, I actually have back here an Axiom, this is an Axiom 25 uh, second gen unit, and you know it's got a full set of uh, useful controls on it. It's got eight pots, um, eight velocity sensitive pads, and a single fader uh, or, or, or slider knob that you can use for encoding. And, and it's pretty useful. Um, the problem that I had with this is just the keyboard's not big enough. It's great for doing um, beats or, you know, uh, if you're doing keyboard bass, it's phenomenal for that. So little lines work well, um, but playing bigger parts uh, doesn't work. However, the thing that that keyboard did give me is because of the fact that the display shows you controller information as it sends it, I could figure out the MIDI controls that it was sending and then figure out how to map those in the Behringer so that basically I could ape the functions of that keyboard. Um, so that's what we're going to be doing here. Now to get started, you do need to know a few things about your keyboard. Remember that your Behringer motor has two modes, MIDI and Mackie control or MC, and you'll see these on the controller under the operation mode. It's right under your display on the left side. Now we're going to use the MIDI mode exclusively. The MC mode is great for DAWs that support MC, so right out of the box you can do all sorts of great things with the Behringer motor, but Pro Tools doesn't support Mackie control or MC mode, so we're going to stay in MIDI mode for the whole process. There are a few functions that the keyboard can't send on its own, it's also important to know that. Um, I'm going to do another video that's going to show you how you can use a simple utility to capture and transform those commands to do some really cool things, for example with your pads. Another thing to keep in mind is if you have just started with your Behringer, you probably only have one preset on it, and that's the default preset. So before you get started, you're going to want to create a new preset that you're going to use to actually create all the custom mappings, because the default preset that's in the Behringer motor is there to make sure that you always have a fallback. And so you can't really change a lot of that and have it stick. Um, so the first thing that you're going to want to do is make a preset. The easy way to do this is hit the edit button. It's third from the left, right under the display, and you'll have a presets uh, option. Select the presets option and choose save or copy preset. And what you're going to do is you're going to copy this preset, the default preset, to a brand new location. Now, after you've done that, it's also advisable if you rename that preset. So I'm going to assume that you're copying from the default preset zero to a new preset number one doesn't have to be number one, you could create it in another slot if you like. You may have some presets of your own already for other DAWs, and that's fine. So just use a new slot. Once you've created the preset, make sure you rename it to something useful. I changed mine to Pro Tools, and that way I can always tell when I go to that preset that I'm set up for Pro Tools.
Now, the other thing I wanted to note is that uh, we are really kind of overcoming some MIDI limitations in Pro Tools. Pro Tools is not really meant primarily for MIDI musicians. It's meant for people who are doing audio recording. If you're looking for deeper integration or deeper MIDI functions, Pro Tools may not be the right DAW for you. I'm not here to sell DAWs. Um, I know what works for me and you have to use what's great for you. So let's move on. Now, MIDI messages come in different varieties, including note messages like pitch, note on and note off and velocity. There are also controller change messages or CC messages, and they have a controller number and data. Each of those numbers can be between zero and 127. What we're gonna do is we're gonna map the controls on the motor to the messages that we want Pro Tools to get, the messages that it expects from an M-Audio keyboard controller. So the first thing to do is go into your Pro Tools setup. Start with your motor on and connected. Make sure that uh, your system is up. You may want to use the MIDI Studio app to check that you're getting information from your motor keyboard. So in Pro Tools, assuming that you have everything set up, go to your global preferences for MIDI controllers. Open from the menu, go to setup and preferences, and under MIDI controllers, add a controller of type M Audio Keyboard. Now you wanna point this to your motor port one, both send and receive and eight channels is fine. Why port one? Well, port one is your MIDI controller mode on your motor. We're not gonna use port two because that's meant for Mackie control. Now, also important here, you don't need to disconnect or remove other controllers. Um, I often run with the fader port in Huey mode as an additional controller, and they work at the same time just fine. In fact, you'll see that changes that you make with one controller will affect the other. Now, the next thing we have to do is set some global settings on the motor. So you're gonna to go to the global settings uh, that's your global button. And for MIDI clock, we want to select external USB clock. And that should allow your motor to take timing from your DAW, such as tempos for arpeggiation. Then hit back. Next, go to the transport mode and make sure MIDI control is selected. And then hit back twice. Now go to the faders mode and select motor MIDI on off. Make sure that it's set on. We want those faders to work. We want their motors to work then hit back again. And similarly, make sure that the touch MIDI on off is turned off. Then you can hit global to return to the main global menu. This touch setting isn't optimal, but Pro Tools is limited in what MIDI messages it's prepared to receive. Normally what this touch setting does is it lets the DAW know that you want to move a control and it lets you take over or record to automation. But without a Huey, it's not really easy to do that. So in plain MIDI mode, uh, that's something that we have to get rid of. Now we're going to do some motor control settings. This is actually the meat of what we're doing. If you want to set new controller numbers, uh, you do need to know what MIDI controllers Pro Tools expects. And I have those all set out for you in this video. Now, before you start, make sure that you're on fader bank one to eight, encoder bank one to eight, and pad bank one to eight. So we're gonna start with faders. From the global menu, we're gonna select MIDI and then change control. And we're gonna live in here for a while. We're gonna be in this change control menu for a while. Select fader one by moving the F1 fader. Now make sure that you do more than just touch it. If you touch it, you're gonna see fader touch one appear in the window. We actually want fader one. Once you select that, don't touch it again or the fader touch controller is then reselected. If that happens though, it's not a big deal. Just move the fader again and now fader one is selected rather than fader touch one. Click the knob to select and then select USB plus MIDI by clicking the knob again. We're going to stick on MIDI channel one for now, so select MIDI channel one by clicking the knob again. That should be the default. If it's not, change it using the data knob to, to be MIDI channel one. Click the knob to select. Then for the MIDI controller change number, we're going to choose 33 by dialing the knob and then clicking. You might see a message that the setting may conflict with another controller. That's fine. Confirm it anyway by clicking the knob again. Set the start value as zero by clicking the knob, or if you have to, change the data so that the starting value is zero, then click. Then set the ending value to 127 the same way by turning the dial until the value is correct. Click the knob again. Now the display shows change success. That's fantastic. Now we've actually changed our first fader control and it should map to your DAW. If you don't have a track already selected, go to the very first track in your Pro Tools session. If you don't have one, just create a simple audio track and you'll be able to watch your fader moving now. Now we need to do this for each additional fader, F2 through F9 on the keyboard controller. So 
You don't have to leave the change control menu to do this. Simply hit the forward button. It's right under your data knob. Once you hit that forward button, you'll be able to automate a new control simply by reaching out and twiddling it. So we're going to do that again for faders F2 through F9. Now you're going to repeat the steps that we already did. You're going to use the MIDI change controller numbers 34 to 40. Remember that we use 33 for F1, and so 34 to 40 are going to map F2 to F8. F9 is going to use controller 41, and that's your master fader. You're going to set it exactly the same way, and what's going to happen is when you're done, the eight faders will now control the eight selected faders in your Pro Tools session that your keyboard controller is banked to. You might be thinking, well, that's great, but what if I have 16 or 24 or more tracks in my session? No problem. I'm going to show you later how we can use bank controls and set the Behringer up for them as well. The other thing to note is you're going to get faster at this programming as you go. Uh, the only thing you'll be changing is you're incrementing a number, so it should go pretty quickly. Next, we're going to map the encoders. Again, you can start by hitting the forward button and then turn one of the encoder knobs to start the process. Notice that we have eight of them. So for each of these knobs, you're going to use a controller change message or a CC message, and you want to set those to 17 to 24 for your knobs E1 through E8. So each one's going to get a separate controller. Knob E1 will get 17, knob E2 will get 18, and so on and so forth until you reach number 24 for E8. The data type that you want for these knobs is not absolute, it's relative. Now when you're done, these encoders are going to map to the pan controls for each of your tracks, the eight tracks that are selected in your current bank. Now one caveat about the encoding, you can turn clockwise or pan towards the right very smoothly, but when you turn counterclockwise and pan towards the left, that's going to happen fairly quickly in steps. That might seem like a problem at first, but actually it's pretty useful because it means that if you turn too far to the right, it's very easy to correct that. And at the, by the same token, if you turn to the left and you skip over the panning that you want, it's very easy to turn back to the right and fine tune very quickly. Now, it's also important to know that if you use a stereo audio track, the pan is only going to work on the left control. I don't work with stereo audio that much when I'm recording, so this hasn't been a problem for me. Next, we're going to map the transport controls. And these are going to map uh, kind of differently because uh, they are going to perform functions generally both when you press them and when you release them. Now again, we can just continue mapping change controls by hitting the forward button and then hit the control that you're looking to map on the transport. These are your rewind, fast forward, stop and play, and etc. below the encoder knobs. After you hit the forward, simply hit the rewind button. We're going to map this as control 114. We're going to choose a momentary switch, not a toggle switch. And the values that we're going to use are going to be different than what we used for the faders. So we're going to start with a value of 127, and then we're going to end with a value of 0. For each of these transport controls, they're going to work exactly the same way, all of them as momentary switches, and all of them with a value of 127 to start and 0 to end. So the rewind is going to be controller 114, as I mentioned. Fast forward is going to be controller 115. Stop will be 116, play is 117, loop, where it's going to change here, is 113, and then record is 118. Once you've mapped all those controls, now the transport's going to work so that, for example, when you hit play, your tracks will start playing from the insertion point, and stop, of course, will stop them. Rewind and fast forward will work just like you think. If you press them, the insertion point will jump ahead by a unit, whatever unit you have selected in your transport, such as a second or a few seconds, or a bar or a few bars, however you have your transport controls set up in Pro Tools. If you hold the rewind and fast forward, the insertion point will move quickly, uh, either backwards or forwards, however you like. Now the loop button actually lets you do some other cool things. If you hold down the loop and press play, you'll be in a loop play mode. If you hold down the loop button and you hit record, you'll be in a loop record mode. And if you hit them again, you'll turn that loop play or loop record off. If you hold down the loop key and hit rewind, you're going to go to the start of your timeline, the very beginning of your timeline. If you hit uh, loop fast forward, you're going to move to the end of your effective timeline. Lastly, if you hit the record button, you'll set a record mode. And if you hit play in record mode, then either your count off will start or you'll start recording, depending on how you have Pro Tools set up. 
Now you will notice that sometimes the lights may be out of sync. This is kind of unavoidable, unfortunately, because of the nature of the controller that we're using. So just ignore that and use the Pro Tools transport by visual so that you know what's going on. Now, finally, we're going to map some pad controls. Now, you can get pretty creative with pad controls. I'm just going to go over some simple options here. The one thing that I think is really necessary is to be able to navigate around your tracks. Remember how I said that we're setting up so that you have a bank of eight tracks that you can control volume and pan on. Well, of course, if you have 16 or 24 or more tracks, you might want to actually control those as well. So I'm going to show you how to map these controls on the pads so that you can bank left or right or move your track left or right. Each pad is going to be set up to a different controller change message number, just like our other controls on our motor keyboard. The way that I map these is P1 and P2, I use bank left. So P1 will be controller change 14 and P2 will be controller change 15. P3 and P4 I use for track left and right. So P3 will be controller change 110 and P4 will be controller change 111. Finally, I use P5 and P6 for solo and mute on each track. So whichever the selected track is, P5 and P6 will allow you to solo or mute. So P5 will be controller change 13 and P6 will be controller change 12. And again, make sure all of these are set as variable value. Now, once you're done, you're gonna find that you can control your Pro Tools rig, all of its basic functions using what I've mapped. Now, there are some fancy things that you can do with pads as well. Um, I do some cool things with uh, P7 and P8, uh, and I use a, a cool utility to do that. And I'm going to show you how to do that in another uh, video. For now, I hope that this has helped you out. And uh, if you like, please leave some comments below. If you discover some better ways of doing things or if you have some information to share, please do so in the comments. Um, I do ask that you guys, you know, be nice to each other, be kind, make sure that, uh, you know, it's all about being creative. This is just a tool to help you do what you want. Um, you may have other tools that you like. If so, that's fantastic. So support each other and have fun. And I hope you enjoy uh, what you've learned about your motor controller. Take care. Peace.